Section 11.2 is called Vectors in Space, and what you're going to feel like as you take a look at this section is that it's very, very much like 11.1, .1, where we did vectors within the plane. So what we're going to do is we're going to extend our ideas from a two-dimensional space, R2, into a three-dimensional space, R3. A point in three-dimensional space can be recognized as an ordered triple, so it has three coordinates, x, y, and z, where the coordinates represent the signed distance from the origin. So the first thing that we're going to take a look at is how to plot a point in three dimensions. So we're going to use the conventions that your textbook is using. Um, and they're standard in the sense that this is, this is what some textbooks use. They're slightly different than other textbooks, so you may see variations of this. So this axis that I'm drawing right now is a vertical axis. That's going to be our z-axis. And then your x-axis sort of comes out at an angle to the left and your y-axis at an angle to the right. So this is z up here on top, and this one's x, and this is y. And the axes that I've actually drawn are actually the positive parts of those axes. So if you wanted to imagine what it would look like for, say, x to be negative, we would actually go the other direction backwards, and I'll, I'll use these dotted lines to kind of give you some, some space, spatial dimension, and this over here would be going in the y direction backwards, and then if we went in the z direction negative, we would go down. So we'll keep those in there for some, some perspective. <coughs> now the point that we're going to be plotting is the point 3, 1, negative 5. So of course this is x and then y and then z. So the x value being 3 out simply means we're going to move 3 out along the positive x-axis. And then we need to move out 1 along the positive y-axis. Well, 1 along the positive y-axis would be here. So if we sort of drew in this sort of a dotted dimension of what's going on here and over to here, you can imagine that our point, if we were just plotting those two coordinates of it, would be in this corner right here. Now we're not actually plotting that point, so I'm going to erase that here in just a second, because we actually need to go down 5 as well. So let me just take a look at this and go down 5. So here's down 5, but we need to get this sort of drawn in perspective. That down 5 has to give us a down 5 from here, because these are my coordinates. Let me draw from here first, actually. And so we actually need to go down 5, and it needs to be this, this line that I'm sort of going to draw out from that fifth mark down is going to have to be parallel to what I had before, so something like this. We're, we're basically making a, a box, like a three-dimensional box here. And so you can imagine this happening. Sorry, my line wants to keep tilting. Oh, that's not right. All right, something like this anyway. It's not perfect, but, but you get the right idea. And then down here is the corner that I've got. So you've gone sort of, I'll, I'll draw it in in red, you've gone over 3, or in the x direction, over 1 in the y direction, and then down 5 in the z direction. So we end up at that bottom coordinate that's the ordered pair. And if you want to give it a name so that we can label it, we can call this point A or something like that. Or I guess you use capitals usually when you're working with points, so we'll say capital A. <coughs> All right. Now, I haven't actually written in the, the equation for doing this because it is so similar to doing this with two dimensions, but this says to find the distance between the given points. So what you'll remember is that the distance formula in two dimensions looks like this. It's x1 minus x2 squared plus y1 minus y2 squared. And since we have a third dimension, all we have to do is add in basically the z1 minus z2 squared. So we're looking at the difference in each one of these values. So if we look at our x values, 2 and 5, the difference in those x values is 3, so that's 3 squared. The difference in the y values is 1 and 4, 5, so that's 4, so this is 4 squared. And then the difference in my z values is actually 0, so this is then plus basically 0 squared. So we actually end up getting the square root of 25, which is 5. So the distance between these two points is actually the value 5. Alright, and again, I haven't shown you um, a, like an equation set up or a formula for doing this because it is just like it is in two dimensions. If we're adding the vectors a 
plus b, we're just adding them component-wise. I'll stick with the components in this, this i, j, k form since it was given to me that way. Uh, but we add the i's together, so there's, there's 2i. And then we add the j's, which makes that negative 7j. And we add the k's, which makes that positive 2k. So that's a plus b. Uh, if we want to do a minus 3b, well, we need to take the b coordinate and triple it and then subtract. Or we could actually think about multiplying by negative 3. So that's what I'm going to write in here above the b. So this is negative 3i. It would be plus 9j and then minus 12k. And we're going to add that to the first vector a that we had. So that actually ends up giving me negative 2i. And then I have positive 5j. And then the negative 2k plus the negative 12k would be negative 14k. The last one in this direction set actually asks us to find uh, a magnitude, but it's a magnitude of a specific vector. So the first thing I'm actually going to do is find the vector itself. So this is 4a plus 2b. So just kind of like I did in the last one, what I'm going to do is I'm going to write here above my vectors what they are when they're multiplied by these scalars. So like I've got the number 4 multiplied by a, so this is 4i minus 16j minus 8k when it's multiplied by 4. I mean, so basically I've written in this is 4a. And then if I do 2b, I'll, I'll multiply every component of b by 2. So this is 2i minus 6j plus 8k, and then we can add them together. So if I add them together, we get 4i plus 2i is 6i. Negative 16j, negative 6j is negative 22j. And then negative 8k and positive 8k is actually 0, and we can leave that off, or if you feel more comfortable writing in plus 0k, that's fine too. But what we really want is the magnitude of this, not so much the vector itself. So this ends up giving me the square root of 36 plus 484, because that's 22 squared, which is the square root of 520, which simplifies slightly because it is divisible by 4, so the square root of 4 would be 2, and then I have two square roots of 130, so the 130, 130 is left over. So that's my magnitude. All right, again, like in the last section, we're going to find something about vectors that are parallel. So it wants us to find a unit vector in particular on this problem. So if you'll remember, a unit vector is basically the same vector we started with, but sort of shrunk down to be one unit long. And so in order to figure out how much to shrink it, we have to figure out how big it is to begin with. So we need to figure out what the magnitude is. So let's call this vector A, so that I can talk about finding the magnitude of A, a little bit more condensed notation. So this would be the square root of 9 plus 1 plus 4, which is the square root of 14. So my unit vector will have this square root of 14 sort of as the denominator of each of those components, because I'm going to divide each one by square root of 14. But even as I do that, if I'm wanting the unit vector, and I want to simplify um, so that I have, simplify is not a good word, I want to rationalize the denominator anyway, then I would actually end up with 3 square root 14 over 14. I'd have square root 14 over 14, and then 2 square root 14 over 14. Although this last one, as you can see, the 2 and the 14 would simplify, so I'll go ahead and reduce that as well. So this would be 1 over 7. So it would be square root, 17, square root of 14, excuse me, over 7. <clears throat> and then part B is a little strange kind of a question. It wants us to write this as a product of the magnitude, so the magnitude was square root of 14, times the unit vector. And the unit vector was the 3 square root of 14 over 14, and the square root of 14 over 14, and the square root of 14 over 7. Now you might notice that we actually didn't do quite all the directions. This is basically what we did in the last section is these two components. But the directions actually asked us to find two unit vectors. Now we can find vectors that are parallel all day long. All we've got to do is multiply the um, vector that we've been given by another value. But we want a unit vector, it means that we can't just multiply it by any value because we want it to stay one unit long. So instead of taking um, this where it is and dividing it by square root of 14, we could also do the negative of that, and that will still keep it one unit long. It just changes the direction. So another unit vector, oops, sorry. So another unit vector would actually look just like this one, but, but negative. So negative 3 square root 14 over 14, negative square root 14 over 14, and negative square root 14 over 7. So that would be another option for a unit vector. 
All right, our next question, again, looks just like what we had going on. We're, we're processing through this very much like we did in 11.1. .1. We're doing a vector now with a given magnitude, so the magnitude is actually supposed to be 3 now, not 1. So just like in the last section, the first thing we wanted to do is we wanted to figure out, well, what is the unit vector? So that gives me a length of 1, and then I can multiply it by 3 to give me a length of 3 for my magnitude. So the first thing we'll do is we'll find a magnitude for this vector v. So this is 3 squared, which is 9, plus another 9, plus 1, which gives me the square root of 19. And then my unit vector would be taking that square root of 19, just like I did in the square root of 14, and multiplying it through this particular problem. Again, since it's given in the ijk format, I'll keep that. If you want to change it, you can. So when I do this and then I rationalize, I get 3 square root 19 over 19i plus 3 square root 19 over 19j minus the square root of 19 over 19k. And then I want to have a magnitude of 3, so I'll multiply everything here then through by 3. So I get 9 square root of 19 over 19i plus 9 square root of 19 over 19j minus 3 square root of 19 over 19k. And this would be the vector. It's parallel um, or in the same direction as, um, and then it has the magnitude of 3 then instead of a, a magnitude of square root 19 or a magnitude of 1. So we could come our intermediate step in there with that magnitude of 1. All right, so the last thing that we're going to look at in this section is the equation of a sphere. Now, what you might remember, and this is sort of an aside here, let me kind of put this sort of in, in sort of brackets, is let's actually write down what the equation of a circle is, and then we're going to three-dimensionalize it, because a circle in two dimensions is very much like a sphere is in three dimensions. It has a lot of the same properties. So what you'll probably remember about the equation of a circle is that it looks something like this. You have x minus x1 squared plus y minus y1 squared, and it equals to the radius squared. So if we take that idea and we do a three-dimensional version of it, kind of like we do with the distance formula, then the equation for the sphere takes on a very similar look. It's x minus x1 squared plus y minus y1 squared, and then we need the third component, z minus z1 squared equals r squared. So that's the equation of our sphere that we're going to be using. And, of course, this x1, y1, z1 is our center of our sphere in three dimensions. And then this is my radius, r that is, and then it's squared as well. So let's take an example. We are going to find an equation of a sphere with radius r and center abc. And so my center ABC, that's my X1, Y1, Z1 that I used in my notation. So this ends up being X minus 3 squared plus Y minus 1 squared plus Z minus 4 squared equals R squared and R is 2, so this would be 4. All right, one more question about spheres. Our other question here has to do with taking an equation um, that's a geometric shape in three dimensions because it's got an x, y, and z, and figuring out what the equation is. Now, this equation is definitely a sphere, and let me show you how I'm making that claim. Notice that all three have a, a squared term, like x is squared, y is squared, and z is squared. They're all squared in there. And also notice that their coefficients all match. Now, these coefficients all happen to be 1. That wouldn't have to be the case. Um, but it is on this particular problem. So they all match, and they all have a squared term, so this is going to be a sphere. But to describe it the way that we're expected to describe this, we need to describe the sphere in relation to its radius and its center. And so in order to find those components, what I need to do is I need to actually complete the square. So if you take a look, we've got x squared minus 2x, and to complete that square, we take that middle term, negative 2, divided by 2, and square it, so we get a 1. If I get a 1, I am left add a 1 on the left, I have to add a 1 on the right. Now the y squared is the really nice one because it doesn't have a linear term of y, so I don't have to complete the square on that one. And then the z term to complete the square, I've got z squared minus 4z. And then I need to um, divide negative 4 by, by 2, which would be negative 2, and then squared would be a positive 4. And again, if I add 4 to the left, I need to add 4 to the right. So then we will actually factor these, and we, we create, you know, what 
what completing the square does is it actually allows us to create factors that are perfect squares. That is, it's a square number times a square number. So the factors end up being x minus 1 quantity squared on this one. And the other one is z minus 2 quantity squared. And then it equals 5. So just like we said, this is a sphere with center. And the center components are coming from here and here and here. It looks sort of funny the way I've described them, but the center is actually going to be a positive 1, a 0 for y, and then a 2 for z. So it's 1, 0, 2. And it has a radius, not of 5, but of square root of 5 because it has to be square root, or has to be r squared on the right hand side of the equation, so it must be square root of 5 squared. And that's it for this particular section.